Oh, it's, it's a great honor to be here. I was with some of you at dinner last night. There's so much energy in the, of the humankind in the, in the group. There's so much to do, more than ever. And I've got a lot to cover in a fairly short time, so I will do what I can. First of all, to get us all on the same page, I think none of you have seen this graph. It hasn't been very widely distributed. It was done by Professor at Harvard, Jim McCarthy. He's from, therefore, therefore Massachusetts is moving. And Massachusetts has moved between uh, 1961, 90 to, let me see if I, uh, do I have a pointer? Uh, I'll move it. Uh, so at the top, you have uh, Massachusetts where it normally was, where it normally is, but it's already warmer, so it's moved south a bit um, to uh, New Jersey. No, to New, to New York. Then it comes down further, but how much further it goes depends on how much emissions we have in two steps. And if we don't take care of climate at all, by the end of the century, it's down here. If we do, it's the lower of the three yellow triangles. So we have a warming planet, and this is an interesting way to make, make it dramatic. Um, we have a new result uh, in that April is always the highest concentration of carbon dioxide in, uh, as measured on the slopes of Hawaii, uh, Mauna Loa on Hawaii, 11,000 feet, very clear air. It hit across 410 last month as a monthly average. It'll average for the year maybe 406 or 407 because it comes down now as the forests grow in the, all through the uh, planet, uh, northern hemisphere. But um, it's gone up and it's gone up and there's no sign of it's doing anything else because we're emitting fossil fuels. We know that extra carbon dioxide is from fossil fuels. So the world, the planet is getting warmer and carbon dioxide is going up. Most of you pause at that, at that point. We've all been taught that that a, a correlation does not imply causation. So I think everybody's on the same page this far. And I think the next step is that it's a parsimonious explanation with a lot of detail behind it, that the two are, there is a causal relationship, that the warming is because the, uh, the molecule carbon dioxide reflects infrared back down on the planet. It doesn't cool off as easily when there's a bigger blanket on. There's lots of reasons why that should be the reason why the planet is getting warmer. There are probably other reasons. We're still emerging from an ice age, but this is, a, this is the dominant reason. And it's not just carbon dioxide, it's other gases. But another strong piece of evidence that there's a connection between warming and carbon dioxide are the ice core records. Extraordinary uh, achievement, but basically starting at the same time as the measurements of carbon dioxide in the 1950s and 60s. It's there that we got a hold of this problem. We might easily not have. I can imagine a world where we actually have a planet that's warming and we have no idea why, because the science isn't good enough. So the idea that, so, so this is a, a two, two curves on top of each other. It's hard to see them apart. One is the temperature in Antarctica inferred from isotopes in the, ice, in the air in the, trapped in bubbles that represent the past air. And the other is the carbon dioxide concentration measured directly. Nobody expected these results uh, when they started drilling. These are such powerful, this, this is, if you like, it's close to a smoking gun, that there's an association in one way or another, strong feedbacks between temperature and carbon dioxide that make this true. So there's a single big idea here that we are confronting one overarching counterintuitive new idea that we are able to change the planet at global scale. We weren't until recently, we can now, we don't want that news at all, we wish we lived on a larger planet, so it's not surprising that there's so much rejection of bad news, the kind of bad news that Galileo brought when he said we aren't the center of the universe, that Darwin brought when he said we weren't any different from the, we were an emerge, emerging from other animals continue in a continuum. And so we have this rejection, which is normal. I don't understand why we can't agree on this much and then move forward. We really have no business creating all this political uh, overlay of what is extremely straightforward, extremely unwelcome, but we got to tough it out and move on. So one way to think about this, so that's, that's my political agenda. I don't think we have any business disagreeing with each other. I truly don't. I think we have to sit down in the same room and say, what is it we're actually talking about when we say we don't or do believe in climate change? So a global picture. This is something I developed to understand the numbers myself that roughly there's a relationship between how warm the, how, how much the planet warms and how much emissions there are of, 
of carbon dioxide cumulatively. And roughly a very big number, 1,600 billion tons of carbon dioxide, gets you about one degree of warming. And we have emitted about 1,600 billion tons of carbon dioxide by now, and we have about one degree of warming. The two degree target that the world has, talked, has been talking about amounts to getting, get, limiting ourselves globally to no more than as much emissions as we've already put in. And if we have a three degree warming, we can put out twice as much. But those are small numbers. Um, and one way to think about those, those are, those, are, those are large efforts, I should say. The two degree target is like that isosceles triangle on the left. Um, we go down at about the same rate as we went up. It took about 80 years of industrialization with fossil fuels, halfway up 40 years back, halfway down 40 years from now. That is approximately the two degree world, highly abstracted. And the three degree world, which people rarely talk about, isn't much more permissive. You get a 40 year, I, I left something out. Emissions today are 40 billion tons of carbon dioxide per year. So the triangle gets you 80 years times 40 divided by two, 1,600 billion tons. The backside, same thing. We'd have to be down by 20 to 20 billion tons a year in 40 years. That is approximately what the two degree world is all about. One and a half is still steeper than that, of course. Sometimes talked about as well. The three degree world, you slot in one 40 year rectangle, 40 billion tons a year high, and you get 40 years of extra flow. But those yellow, yellow arrows point in the direction we're going right now. We're going toward higher emissions every year, and bending that yellow is what the name of the game of bend, that's what bending the curve means. If we did not have climate change, we would be using fossil fuels. There's no shortage of them. This peak oil idea was very dis distracting. There's lots and lots of buried hydrocarbons of all kinds, and we could really bake ourselves. So there is an enormous challenge. Essentially, we're talking about a budget, and budgets aren't fun. Um, and we can talk about, and if it's cumulative, it doesn't matter when we took it out of the ground. It doesn't matter where we took it out of the ground. It doesn't matter where we're using it or for what purpose. All of those become choices, global choices, fraught choices, hard to do choices. Most of us are not in the business of making these kinds of compromises and bargains, but you guys are. And so we rely on you to figure out how to create processes and the Paris Agreement is an example of that, a brilliant invention that none of us with my kind of background ever would have dreamed up. And then the last one of them is it really is, uh, there's a piece of science here. Every time you take a carbon atom out of the ground, you're taking hydrogen with it, just how it happens to work. You don't get black carbon in the ground, you get carbon, you get hydrocarbons. The hydrogen burns to water and gives you energy, the carbon burns to carbon dioxide and gives you energy. The more you can get energy from the water, uh, the better. So when the carbon comes out with a lot of hydrogen, it's better than when it comes out with a little hydrogen. And the ratios are underground vary with the kind of fuel, and natural gas has the most hydrogen connected to the carbon, and coal the least. That is why the coal gas competition is so engaged with the, um, the, any kind of carbon policy you could dream up. Any carbon policy injures coal relative to natural gas, and both industries know it and you know it too. And if we're going to have hydrocarbons, natural gas, cleanly developed with no leaks, is the, which can be done, uh, is the preferred fossil fuel from the point of view of budgets. So I wrote a paper with Steve Piccolo that some of you know, but most of you don't, but it was in 2004, and we were looking across the options for low carbon futures. And the paper was extremely popular because we did not pick winners. We were agnostic about what would be the leading, what would be the promise, what, which of the various promising options would, would actually play out. And it's 14 years ago. So, the, so have in mind that each of those horses is a, is a low carbon strategy, energy efficiency, biomass, uh, nuclear power, whatnot. Um, 14 years later, and I developed this slide just a couple of months ago, uh, what does it look like? Well, the horses are spread out. And um, name for me, please, now, the horses you think are in front. Anybody? Wind. Wind, Wind is in front. Anybody else? Solar. Solar's in front. I happen to agree with you. Um, and so we have this 
race that has shown to, some, to many people's surprise, including mine, how much the costs of, of solar and wind have come down. In the back, something we were intrigued with in, the, in 2004. Is there a comment? 2004 was hydrogen fuel. This is all personal. People, can dis people do disagree with every one of the judgments I'm about to tell you. But we were not, a, we had a very negative view of batteries in 2004. The Prius had yet, not yet arrived. We knew we needed a, f a fuel that didn't have a carbon in it uh, for transportation. And there was a lot of it. And President Bush said that the child born at that time would drive a hydrogen car. And there's a lot of upbeat state, uh, views of the hydrogen economy, which I think are out of date now because the battery has turned out to work uh, as a transportation option. And so you have the, no, the zero carbon fuel in the form of electrons. Um, carbon capture and storage and nuclear power have fallen way short of where we expected them to be. Um, and that doesn't, this is not the end of the race. And in both cases, one can really misunderstand this picture if one thinks the race is over. Uh, gas for coal, which really elected our president, um, has done extraordinarily well with the fracking discoveries pushing coal out of, out of the Ohio Valley power plants and elsewhere. Um, and efficient coal plants, which are, which are something that I just read the Japanese are building coal plants now, but saying they're the most efficient ones at all. They are better than what they would have built. End use efficiency, which I'm going to say more about. Um, biological options like reforestation and less deforestation and storage, which I call a dark horse. I owe these pictures to Greta Shum. I know she's in the room, but she put these together for me, and we agreed that this was a dark horse. Uh, we hadn't had it on our list. It's essential for the uh, fossil energy, for the renewable energy future. So solar and wind are out in front, and the plummeting costs are the most exciting development of the past decade. It was not market. It was, it was market mechanism to form of policies, but it was not a carbon price that brought this incredible uh, payout for a bet. And the swap of the fossil, current fossil energy system, that's a big word, even though four letters long, for an energy system that dominated by solar and wind no longer seems fanciful. I mean, that wasn't true 10 years ago for many of us. It just seemed it was not within reach. The obstacles, I'll talk about them for a moment. I'm going to show you a picture of them. So here's the, here's the, so this is California. This is a, a summer day in 2016. Most rarely do you see data exactly like this, but the dark orange is utility solar, and the yellow is, is a, a distributed solar, both residential and commercial scale. And there are two problems on this graph that are being increasingly recognized. They're more for solar than for wind, but you get a noon depression of the need for non-renewable non energy. And the deepness at noon, where that double arrow is, gets deeper and deeper as you deploy, and you have to shut down stuff. And or, and this is where you guys come in, you move load into the noon period uh, by incentives that you guys figure out and write in that makes, first of all, spot market pricing, so that the, there is a business to go to a home or a, or a store and put in the gadgets that will turn the stuff on at noon just when the electric, when you want the load, turn them off at other times. There's a whole huge investment opportunity that's going to make this, a, that's the smart world. And then in the evening, you have to pull, put on power at an extraordinary rate. They're both difficult. As for wind, this is a map that should be on your walls. Um, really, big, pretty, American, and the Darker, the purple is the strongest winds in the country. And there is the wind, the wind, um, what's it called, bonanza, the, 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 the extraordinary wind in the Midwest, which has gone first, all the way down to West Texas. And the other big wind opportunity, and we heard it called last, last night a globally, globally impressive wind resource, is off the coast of the, off the states, most of Many of the people here are from the states that are, have that shore. Um, it jumps out at you that that doesn't have state boundaries going into the ocean, that, the, um, that it's not 
a system where you would like to see every state do it by themselves. In fact, it's not hard to imagine underground cables running parallel to the coast, that uh, power lines, that carry, uh, carry the wind north and south before it comes to shore. So we have a, a really interesting optimization. And the people in this room with this very organization I'm talking to have the opportunity to design, uh, for example, offshore trunk lines. Um, and it says avoid boom, I'm not sure what else showed up down there, avoid boom and bust. That's the other problem. If you don't work coherently, you're all going to be bidding for the same contractors and their prices are going to go up. So you need to think about how to do that. Scarce labor, scarce materials. But consider this is going to take a long time. And we're talking here about going further and further offshore. The wind doesn't die down that fast. Um, as this picture shows, first of all, the scale of the individual wind turbine is astonishing. And there's about to double roughly from the ones, the biggest ones on land have about a 50 meter blade. Biggest ones offshore got about a 100 meter blade. Um, they made, they're made of fiberglass. Those guys are making it um, uh, at the, in, that, in that picture. They're making two halves and put them together. And, um, and the, the, the bottom left picture is, is the offshore world of the oil, oil industry here for wind. The deeper the water, the, the different way, you mount the turbine in a different way, starting with on the, on the bottom and then floating. And we were hearing about a floating platform in Maine. It's going to be one and then the other. It's all about the depth of the water. Close to load, tremendous opportunity. It's been talked about in, in the Northeast. It's getting underway. And then there's this interesting psychological question, which, you, which I, I would love to know more about. When New Jersey proposed and never built a wind farm back in 2008, this picture dates from 10 years ago, they made a point in this picture in the New York Times that the, plant, that, that the turbines would be far enough away that you couldn't see them from shore, meaning the Jersey Shore. And um, if they were 10 miles away, you would. The turbines are bigger now. They probably have to be further away. But most of the, of the ocean surface that this is going to happen on is outward from there. Keep emphasizing, you've got lots and lots of room outward from the shore where you're going to have this resource. But also, I'm wondering whether it's generational and whether younger people really care that, don't enjoy the view of these extraordinary, <laughs> extraordinarily sleek, uh, elegant devices. Um, some of you probably do, and maybe some of you don't. I, I, um, by now, I certainly do. I, I want to say one word about low, carb, low carbon fossil fuel that isn't an oxymoron. Um, carbon capture and storage is the having it, your cake and eating it too. You burn the fuel and get the energy out. At that point, you have carbon dioxide, and it's a separate choice to throw it into the atmosphere as your garbage pail. You could capture it and put it, for example, deep below ground. Uh, this technology was one of those horses that hasn't done very well. There is an ideological opposition to fossil fuels around these very t tight 100% or 80% targets. I think we're overdoing it, at least for now. The great is the enemy. The good is worth repeating about twice a day. And there is a subsidy which, I, how many of you know the, the letter, the, the, the 45Q, have a recognition of 45Q? In Texas, just about everybody does because it is a direct subsidy for, uh, that came into the tax, with the Tax Act last, this January of this year of $35, I'm sorry, I didn't fix this. It's $35 per ton of CO2, not per barrel, uh, for enhanced oil recovery and $50 for, which, for aquifer storage. $50, that's the relevant one for the Northeast. There isn't any enhanced oil recovery opportunity, but there will be low-cost CO2 capture opportunities turning into CO2 projects because of 45Q. Projects have to start in the next six years. Judy Greenwald is in the room, is an architect of this very policy, and she can tell you lots about it. This picture is of a, of a program that ran for about five years and is shut down in Algeria, where CO2 was extracted from natural gas and then put into the ground and, and worked quite well. Efficiency is the big deal. Um, the, we, lay, we leave these opportunities on the table. I got involved with energy efficiency experiments in buildings in 1971 when I came to Princeton. We looked at how buildings, ordinary houses were being built in row houses in a middle class a neighborhood. It was called Twin Rivers. We saw the combination of, of absent-minded design, uh, absent-minded construction, 
ver behavioral variation. And we said, my God, there's a lot of energy that can be saved here. Um, and we measured. We measured house by house. We had utility records, and they were, we, were, we were given them. And we, of course, used discretion about anybody's individual consumption. And we don't measure. The entire weatherization program doesn't measure. <clears throat> and you don't learn if you don't measure. And you're willing to accept that you didn't save the energy you thought. You have to be steal, steal yourself for bad news. Then you measure. Then we get smarter. <clears throat> lots of stuff, lots of talk about equity through this entire subject. There's something called lifeline rates, where the first block of consumption of electricity or gas is at a very low cost. And then you get higher. That takes care of that issue. I don't know, it, it used to be a popular phrase. It seems to have vanished. Um, Spot markets, as I mentioned, where prices really do differ between noon and 6 p.m., uh, generate entire industries. I saw the phrase in, in the material that, that um, was prepared to me by Rona Cohen about deep retrofits of public housing. That makes lots of sense. They weren't built well in the first place. Um, retrofit is part of the story, much more than new building in the Northeast. The appliances, the single best policy from an energy efficiency point of view that has emerged in the last 30 years were appliance efficiency standards, where the industry and the government got together and said, refrigerators could be tighter, everybody's gonna do it. Um, so there's nobody who can slip in with, with, a, with a lower cost product that doesn't work very well. And they've got, they ratcheted up, but they can be, much more of that can be done. And the states come in and things like cash for clunkers. Give us your, your refrigerator still plugged in, nothing in it, um, running, running because you haven't forgotten, you forgot to unplug it. Get some of that stuff out of the end. There's are so many ideas in efficiency that used to be around. And this one may be unpopular, but there's a phrase out there, net zero buildings. It's an architect's game. It just isn't going to make a big difference. Don't be just, okay. yes, it's fine, and have some ribbon cutting, but don't make that the co corner of what you're, uh, cor cor cornerstone of what you're doing. It's in the entire, all sectors, transport, public transport. The, the LED bulb is probably the, one of the two or three most important, maybe right after the wind and solar, you put the LED bulb as a breakthrough that, that is climate friendly. Industry, that's actually a, 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 a efficient motor, small motor. The, tra the substitution of transport for, of, of information technology for transport and a guy in his bathroom. And cogeneration, which is, which is another very important option that we've, many of these ideas were out in the 70s and have disappeared and we, we need to bring them back. A number that you probably will surprise you is that 70% of the electrons or the electricity that leaves the power plants of this country ends up in a building, residential or commercial. About 30% ends up in a factory. So when you're achieving efficiency in a building, you are producing the opportunity not to build a power plant um, or not to replace a power plant. And we aren't taking this anywhere near seriously enough. It's a, it is the kind of thing that a state-led led, or in this case, region-led. Utilities can put certain things in their rate bases. You can encourage private uh, competition with the utilities, and so forth. This problem is particularly acute in the developing world where they're building new stuff. It's more about retrofit here, uh, but we have to do it. Infrastructure. I find it, I, I, when I read the word infrastructure, and we all do pretty much every day in the papers, I'm wondering what is in people's heads when they use the word. I fear that it's only highways, bridges, and tunnels. And the energy infrastructure is absolutely critical to this, this story. And are you, with your interest in the climate story, advocating clearly that the concept has these energy infrastructure investments in, deeply embedded? I, I actually don't know when people, what, what you think, if it ever rolls out of Congress, what it would look like in terms of electricity grids, smart grids, uh, resilient grids, the charging stations, which I think are more the state level than the federal level, but we've got to get more of that clear. But that's a big deal right now. China is building its head off with charging stations. They build the infrastructure, and then they see if the demand follows. We don't do it that way, but we're going to be sorry if we don't. And the natural gas, there's an awful lot of blocking of pipelines. I think many of you know that isn't smart. You wouldn't do it as much if you were thinking regionally. And then methane itself is the second most important greenhouse gas. And there's, a, I don't know if any of you are crossing, your, crossing this particular subject in your readings, but there are major investments now 
by the oil and gas world to reduce methane emissions at the upstream end of the production. And there's clear evidence that there's an awful lot of gas leakage from the time it, it gets to the substation and into people's homes, and we don't really know where it's coming from. There's a whole investigatory follow, uh, uh, program followed by implementation in the, in the gas, natural gas leakage story. Again, an opportunity, a rule, a legislation to study this stuff. Some of the, it's particularly in the old cities that the gas pipelines are 100, gas infrastructures are 100 years old, uh, that the leaks are probably there. They can be found. It's easy to measure them. We have Princeton technology, in fact, on this very topic, because methane is easy to see in the atmosphere. Um, just to tickle you a little bit, I'm going to show two pictures of infrastructure. I, this is sometimes a Rorschach test. I ask my students, what do you see in this picture? Well, one thing you should you see is political coordination. Um, an amazing highway system was built. Could we possibly start today and build that with the way we work? Um, and it's uh, obviously it's transformed our country, and most of us would say for the better. And then we have our power plant infrastructure, also built approximately in the same 50 years. The, the, the red is coal, the yellow is, is nuclear. The coal, kind of like a go game, excludes the yellow uh, from the Appalachian area. Um, you, have a, you have the hydro up in the northwest and so forth. That was an extraordinary achievement. Our power plants are old. And this is a histogram where they go back. The peak is in, 19, is in uh, roughly 1978 in terms of the most capacity added per year. And it's coal and nuclear that are aging. The natural gas, at the, we had a spurt of natural gas construction and now wind construction and solar construction. But the big story is aging plants. Um, and we have these issues of retirement, relicensing, retrofit, repowering, grandfathering, and now we have a new word. I forget what the word is, but it's handouts. Um, so nuclear power, it's about aging plants. Too big to fail should be applied to them, um, but they will be closed. You might think you could bail out, you bail out GM and it's around. The nuclear plants aren't gonna stay forever. Uh, they will be closed, and it seems that we do not have any expectations of having nuclear plants replace nuclear plants. That's why we're trying so hard to keep them going. We have lost our nuclear industry. I don't think even the Koreans and the Chinese will be in a position to supply a nuclear plant, but that could turn out to be different. But you have to, you, this idea of doing it one or buying three years at a time is embarrassing, frankly. Then they're on the storage. Right now, those plants are far more hazardous than they need to be. And that's a lack of will on the part of the states and the federal government. Uh, the dry cask storage, I'll show you, well, I'll show you a picture right now. This is, the, this is a nuclear plant in, um, in Virginia on the Chesapeake. And in the foreground, you see dry casks. You don't see many pictures of these. They're about two or three per year. Uh, handle the wastes after they've cooled down in a pool. So you can figure out how long ago, long that's been running. And in our three uh, nuclear plants in New Jersey by the, by the Delaware Bay, there is dry cask storage, but they're using it in, in, a, in a parsimonious way. Um, they, they have far too much uh, radiation in the, in the swimming pools. I have a colleague, Frank von Hippel, who briefed me about this. He tried to get the state legislature to put more into the current legislation about this issue. It's, just, it's actually outrageous, not to, for, because if there is a leak, the dry casks are not protected the way the, sorry, the swimming pools where the re waste goes first are not protected the way they are where the power plant itself is. They're not inside a dome. You could have major leaks. And one leak in one plant shuts them all down. Uh, that's the way pol politics will work, I suspect. Carbon prices. I'm almost done. The, um, it's interesting to me that rarely do you hear a number in a discussion of carbon price. You talk about the structure of the agreement, what's going to get covered, what the money's going to get used for. It really matters whether it's $10 or $100 a ton. $10 a ton, which is sort of in the Reggie range, um, you don't get a lot to happen. You don't really don't get a lot to happen. You don't get the major investments that would be that are that are the point. The point is to drive action. So resist tokenism. Ask about that. $100 a ton is very high, um, but it's really what's required if you're going to use this mechanism as opposed to more direct, targeted incentives. To get the kinds of things to happen that are resulting from targeted incentives, you need a high carbon price. So $100 a ton is $40 a barrel. 
you get that you get that kind of a swing. We're getting it right now, but at five million five dollars a million BTU. The cost is now two. It would be seven. It's been seven, and huge price on coal, two hundred dollars a ton. Downstream, where there's all these, if it's a straight pass through, as some things are, with no overheads attached, it's less than a dollar a gallon. It's only it is eight cents. I shouldn't say only. It is eight cents a kilowatt hour for coal plant and four cents for a natural gas plant. So you, we need to know these numbers. Obviously, figure out 50, you divide everything by two. The message that comes through loud and clear from reading the documents that Rona prepared me, I found myself suddenly, I'm Alexander Hamilton. I'm reading the rules in the government around 19, what, 1780, just before the country start getting their act together. Hamilton is one of the people driving toward a federal, federal rule. Here, we're talking about driving toward at least a regional solutions. Um, share best practices. I've come up with a, with a metaphor for the Paris Agreement, where the nations of the world regularly come together and tell, tell each other what they've accomplished in the pre and what they're going to do, that it's a potluck dinner. That's the amazing invention. When you go to a potluck dinner, you don't bring uh, a, a hamburger from McDonald's. You bring something you're a little bit proud of. And you look around at the other things, and people did something you realized you could do that you never thought of. That's the invention the diplomats came up with. Its, equiv it's equivalent is what can happen from you guys uh, if you've in, through, you, through institutions like the one that's hosted this meeting. Um, and, and it should. And then, of course, we've got some place to save for what, I call, what people call fragile values. In New Hampshire, they want to have a lot of solar, which will take field after field and mountainside after mountainside and turn it into solar collectors. It really worries me. I understand people are, can, have a, you guys have an ag uh, subcommittee as well as this one. Um, we have to be careful about things we really care about. So I've collected a few of my recommendations. Efficiency, efficiency, efficiency. <laughs> Spot markets. Uh, an electric grid that gets into the, a major share of the investment in infrastructure. Watch out for boom and bust in oil and expect it to be big. You're just starting. This is not something that's going to stop with a few, with a few gigawatts. Uh, plan ahead for the closing of nuclear plants and require more care with the, with the wastes. And think regionally. Um, so a quick advertisement. Uh, I've written or led, a, led different groups to write um, what we call distillates for the Anglinger Center. One on grid scale storage, one on small modular reactors, one on nuclear fusion, one on solar power. We're finishing one on wind right now. They're on the web of the Anlinger Center. The executive summaries are outside. I'd love to have them used more. I'd love to find out that some of you can actually enjoy them. They're written for an audience like you, like your staff. Somebody comes in, uh, they, they're bright, they're, they're, they don't, there's not an equation in them, but there's lots of, of, of technical argument in, a, in, a, in the sort that, in a way that you, you can appreciate. This goes up if that goes down. Things like that that you get when you read it if we've done it well. So I hope that they can have greater impact. I'm done. I'm looking forward to your questions. We have time for plenty of questions. Uh, and there's a microphone going around. I think we just have one microphone. So if you get a, oh, there's two microphones, one on each side of the room. Okay. Andrew, you're going to answer some of the questions. <laughs> well, I'll do my best. Hi, uh, my name is Jonathan. I'm from the Princeton Student Climate Initiative. Um, yeah, thank you. First of all, thank you for that talk. If the slides are posted online, we'd uh, really appreciate it. They will be. Okay, great. Um, I just had a question about natural gas. Um, so, uh, like, uh, as a group, we've spoken to a lot of the communities that. Uh, live near pipelines and uh, and near plants, and there's a lot of concern about uh, about leaks and pollutants uh, related to uh, pollutants that aren't just carbon dioxide, but things like PM two point five. Um, you bet you. Okay, so um, there's there's concern about pollutants like PM two point five, things that cause asthma and lung cancer, and that's really behind a lot of opposition to natural gas. Um, there's a pipeline being built nearby, uh, Compressor Station 206. Um, and so I was just wondering, are there ways, uh, you know, you're, you're very uh, pro-natural gas, and if, and if so, if you see ways that, um, 
there are ways to, to use gas and develop it in a way that doesn't uh, arm respiratory health. You don't really get a chance to use gas if you don't have a pipeline. Um, and pipelines have been uh, controversial since the first ones. Uh, they tend to be um, people where there was a whole concern for explosions. You don't hear it this time. Leakage of pollutants, there's so many, it's so much less bad than coal, but they don't leak. They're not supposed to leak. Um, so I, I actually don't understand why the, how that could get m much many legs. Um, but I'm, I mean, they have to be done with care. You, if you plant, we, we, we could be easily building more than we need or in the wrong place because, we're, because of the way it's balkanized right now. I know, I know uh, Bonnie Watson Coleman was trying to get a, something through, the, through FERC, I believe, that would have increased the amount of scrutiny of the specific planning of individual gas lines so they weren't done one at a time. That sounds like a great idea. Um, I don't think it's gone through the legislature, but it could be done, some of that could be done at the state level especially at a regional level. Uh, you know, the coal, coal emissions were much worse, and then they've cleaned up the coal plants to the point where there's at least, we're, not, we're, not, we're in much better shape than we were 50 years ago when I was a kid and coal was settling on my windowsill every, every, every day. Um, and we had to wipe it off. Um, gas is, oh, is really a lot cleaner. Uh, it's not perfect. And I didn't, and, and uh, the carbon dioxide, I think bothers many people here most because it isn't going to get you to zero if you ha or even to maybe not even down to 90 percent uh, emissions if you really have a lot of gas in the system. Carbon capture and storage is a way to get to that. Um, we should be starting. But on, on the direct air quality issues for natural gas, I have a hard and vis-a-vis -vis the pipeline story, not the power plants. I have a hard time taking that and putting it into the top 20 of the issues when we should be thinking about. Another question. Hi, thanks. I'm Vicki Arroyo with Georgetown Climate Center. And um, I guess uh, my question goes to the lifeline rates that you talk about in the electricity sector. Yes. And whether or not if you would get your wish of higher carbon prices, if you could think about a way to address that in the transportation sector. Because, you know, on the one hand, 80 cents is sort of in the variability that we've experienced in recent years. On the other hand, I think a lot of people would be concerned about that. And as we work, on a regional policy in the Transportation and Climate Initiative. Equity is one of the things that we're trying to address, so we'd love your thoughts on that. Um, and just uh, a point on the price and REGI, I would just say one of the innovations, I think, of REGI is the way that those revenues are used. And so what, while they might not be- The way, the way there's what? The way the revenues are used. Revenue. So the fact that the price itself isn't driving as much change, and yet the way that they're reinvesting in the region in things like building efficiency, weatherization, renewables, I think has been part of the Right, which is why $10 is nothing to sneeze at. It does bring right. Right. numbers in the billions into Thank the you. states, for, and if they're used in good, for good purposes, of course that does matter. And that is one of the, when it's $10 a ton, you have revenues that you can spend without having lots of people climbing in on you when it gets to 100 it's, it, you have to start talking about recycling the money in the economy. Gas, natural, uh, gasoline and, and the poor is, is tricky because you could imagine various ways in which people would pay different amounts at the pump, uh, but they're, they're all very hard to, to, work, to work through. I did show that uh, $100 a ton of CO2, which is a ginormous uh, cost, is, is less than, it's about a penny a, a penny a gallon per dollar a ton. And so we're talking about swings that are happening right now. Um, but uh, and better mass transit and other issues of this sort may come to mind, and even plowing that Reggie money into mass transit. Uh, there's a question over there. Yep. Hi, thank you so much, uh, Professor Sokolow and Simon Linsberger. Uh, so you spoke about how a district project at Princeton uh, working on uh, methane leakage uh, on from pipelines and, and understanding uh, trying to measure that better and that kind of investigative work. I was wondering if you could talk a, a little bit more about what uh, that project is, uh, the work that is being done here about that, and also whether you feel uh, in some sorts of uh, pricing strategies uh, that we should focus on including uh, methane in the pricing strategy as it is a greenhouse gas and it is contributing uh, to some of the externalities uh, in climate change, or it's, that makes more sense for uh, kind of the more individual industry level 
regulation? That's a great question. I think it does make sense. If we're interested in greenhouse gases, we should be taking all the greenhouse gases and applying the same policies to them. There is something complicated about how to weight natural gas, WIGHT, relative to carbon dioxide. It's not a clear answer, but there you just make a choice and people go on from there. It's more potent per ton by a factor between 20 and 100, depending on how you think about it. Um, and it would in incentivize uh, nat natural methane leakage uh, control. Uh, the story is that the Environmental Defense Fund has been conducting and driving this problem, uh, conducted tests around the um, quite a few of the natural gas production uh, areas, including uh, the Barnett in, in Texas, and they did an inventory, and they could track the emissions in the production stage, identify them, get basically what they measured from airplanes and what they could figure out on the ground checked. But when they did the overall inventory, it seemed as if there were natural gas leakages in old cities that were showing up in the inventories. You had gas in it when you measured it flew an airplane uh, that you didn't account for, we can't account for. And that's not really Princeton work. It's work that's been done outside Princeton. But we need to find it. And then it's because it's also wasted money. Thank you. Uh, my name is Upendra Chivukla. I just have a question regarding nuclear. Uh, right? Uh, everybody talks about 100% uh, uh, clean energy. And uh, do you see that uh, as achievable in the next uh, 50 uh, or 30 years? Or uh, when you're trying to retire a lot of these nuclear plants and you are dealing with uh, some of the issues you talked about, the swimming pools and uh, the dry casks is a, is a major issue, and Congress has been unable to uh, come up with a solution for nuclear waste. And so how, where do we go with this nuclear industry, and uh, what is the role it is going to play in this 100% clean, en clean energy, uh, I guess, the goals and objectives? So I, I'm a, I'm a, I studied nuclear science when I was a grad student and young, fa young faculty member, and it's been a huge disappointment to see what looked, the gleam in the eye that was in all of the physicists' heads that this was going to transform the world, that we would have this unlimited, we didn't think low carbon so much, but just, just an, a, no, no air pollution emissions and so forth, that we had an answer. And the industry has done so poorly, communicating to the public. Uh, it, it, the overlay of the experience of the nuclear weapons and of the spookiness of radiation and x-rays and so forth. There's a book called Nuclear Fear by Spencer Weird, which says that by 1900, there was a spookiness and a fear of nuclear, nuclear things, which has turned out to be a very important part of, our, of, of the story. We've had very, very strict standards that have tossed, cost a lot of money to uh, match. I, I think we may, it may be not part of a future indefinitely, whether fusion can look different from fission. Andrew would like me to say yes, I'm not at all sure it can. It is a nuclear technology. Um, China was looking like it would pay no attention to the rest of the world, just go build these things, and, 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 and uh, there, wasn't the, there isn't the same backlog in the public's minds of, of, of fear. It may not happen. If it does, we might be seeing ourselves replacing our 100. We have 100 plants in this country, three of them in New Jersey after the fourth one closes down. Um, uh, I don't think there can be nuclear plants there, and I guess I would have thought so uh, 20 years ago even. Over here. Uh, good morning, Dean Rikerson from Maine. Um, I am an architect, and I wanted to back you up on <laughs> the distraction of net zero uh, uh, buildings. Uh, the, pr the problem is uh, that when you run into, when you say run into a uh, uh, very self-righteous architect, uh, ask them about the life cycle costing of the window component, which is a very important part of a net zero building. Uh, they have a lifespan of, say, 20 to 25 years, which means they have to be replaced uh, that often, which requires a huge amount of energy. So um, I'm surprised it's that big, I have to say. But yeah, it could be less, but you know, but definitely uh, a single glazed window and its components let, can let last me, for hundreds of years. Let me say what bothers me about the zero, the zero uh, carbon house. By implication, you're not asking anything about what's going on in the house. It's clearly, it's, it's why it's associated with architects. It's before anybody lives there, before anybody sets the thermostat, before anybody buys the appliances. And they obviously gonna end up with a, I, w I once gave a talk to architects and afterwards somebody put their arm around me and said, you're a performance guy. 
as opposed to a design guy. Yeah, it's about performance. And if you don't even have a performance in the concept, uh, there's something wrong. And, and actually, that's a problem with lead, uh, the lead rating also. Correct. Is that uh, it doesn't involve the overall I life agree. cycle costing. It doesn't involve monitoring in the future. Monitoring, going out and seeing how a house did. I mean, some lead buildings have been looked at this way. They generally underperform uh, compared to the reward they were given, but they don't have to. And if they were measured, they would a lot fewer than would underperform. Great to have you endorse what I said. I, I hate to cut us off, but I've, I've just gotten the, uh, the sign that we need to move on. I just want to say, please join me in, in thanking Professor Sokolow for really setting the stage for a wonderful topic. <laughs> <laughs>